we are very lucky, happy to have Dino today uh, to talk to us about recent work on kernel methods, Gaussian process, and, inter and everything in between. Uh, so I know Dino from um, uh, when I was doing my PhD, and it was a postdoc at Gatsby with uh, Arthur Grethen on, the, on his grand effort to canalize the world of machine learning. Uh, and he has worked in uh, various topics, uh, uh, testing for, um, so yeah, dependence test, independence test, uh, these kind of things. And he has moved on to um, uh, Oxford as a lecturer, where he's uh, keep doing some uh, theoretical work, statistics uh, and kernel method and Gaussian processes. He has a, um, yeah, some very interesting work recently, and he's going to talk to us about uh, some of these with uh, his students and uh, looking forward to hear the talk today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be able to tell you about my work. So. Uh, I guess Vincent already hinted that my work has been evolving somewhat over the last couple of years from something that was very much on the frequentist side of kernel methods, like hypothesis tests based on RKHSs, to more recently sort of spanning this interface between RKHS methods and Gaussian processes. And uh, today I would like to tell you some about some recent developments, some vignettes on how bringing together the ideas from both frequentist and Bayesian camp of kernel methods can be useful. <laughs> so, uh, so let's get started. And just to say, please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk to interrupt me at any point. So I have a chat window open as well as uh, I guess list of participants. So hopefully I should be able to see if there's a raised hand. Um, great. Uh, so I will start by giving you some background on kernel embeddings. So I will not really give any background on Gaussian processes because I know that's uh, it's very close to uh, the kind of research that you do at Second Mind. Uh, and then uh, after that, I will get into these uh, two specific applications. Uh, so one deals with uh, the problem of uh, statistical downscaling and the other has to do with making causal inferences based on multiple unmatched data sets. And we will see sort of how kernel ideas uh, come useful in those different contexts. Okay, so let's start very basic with uh, background. So what is a kernel method? Uh, a kernel method is any method that endows a generic abstract domain X with some inner product structure. And that inner product structure is induced by some feature transformation phi uh, which is simply some mapping that sends us from uh, this generic domain into an inner product space, uh, Hilbert space H. Uh, so what's important is that different feature maps, different feature spaces may in fact induce the same inner product structure. So we study that inner product structure instead of feature spaces uh, and feature maps. And uh, that is in, uh, in a sense fundamental and we call that kernel. So the kernel function is that something that can be written as an inner product of features, as long as I can find some feature space H and some map into that space, such that K evaluates inner products like so, then K is a valid kernel. Uh, so we said that feature spaces are not unique, but there's one very special feature space uh, called canonical feature space. Uh, and we, uh, we call that reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So this one corresponds to uh, very curious looking feature map where we uh, go from X to the kernel function itself, where one argument is fixed at X and we think of it as a function of this first argument, this dot here. Uh, RKHS is thus a space of functions and satisfies these two properties. First, it contains all of these K dot X objects. And secondly, these K dot X objects somehow play a very special role in that space in that they represent evaluations of any function in the RKHS. So that tells us that these spaces are somehow very well behaved because uh, evaluation is that well behaved continuous functional. 
And then by these properties immediately follows that canonical feature map is indeed a feature map in this sense. So that in a product of the feature maps is the kernel itself. Okay. Uh, there's a useful characterization of what kind of functions are valid kernel functions. It turns out that every positive semi-definite function is a valid kernel function. And that for every positive semi-definite function, there is a unique RKHS. So somehow all the relevant mathematical concepts are happening at these levels. So positive semi-definite functions and RKHS. And that's what this idea of a kernel trick, classical kernel trick is based on. Instead of representing each individual uh, data point with some vector of features, we will implicitly represent it with this canonical feature map. That canonical feature map is some kind of function. It might have some sort of feature representation in some basis like that, but we don't care what it is. The only thing we care about is this inner product structure. Uh, so that's all well known and very classical. And in order to introduce this idea of kernel mean embeddings, we only need to take this reasoning one step further. So rather than representing individual points in our KHSs, now we will represent whole probability measures. And how are we going to do that? Well, we will just take expectations of these canonical features. And this is what's called a kernel mean embedding. And this essentially generalizes one of the classical ways in which we represent probability distributions in terms of moments where we would sort of think about representing distribution in terms of the mean, expectation of x itself, covariance, expectation of x, x transpose, and so on and so forth. So again, we don't really care about those kind of explicit moment representation. The only thing we care about is that there is a particular inner product structure that comes from this representation. And this inner product structure uh, gives us inner products that are just expectations of kernel functions and they are hence very easy to estimate. So this is a very simple idea and yet it has been instrumental in various papers which construct various techniques for hypothesis testing, for two sample problem independence, conditional independence, and so on. Okay. So one of the simplest uses of kernel mean embeddings is to just compute distances between probability distributions. Uh, distance that's induced by kernel mean embedding is known as maximum mean discrepancy, uh, MMD. And many of you will have seen MMD because it's used in lots of different applications. So it's not really a focus of this talk, so I'm not really going to dwell on this slide much. Uh, but what's important is that for a very broad class of kernels called characteristic kernels, these embeddings are useful in a sense that uh, they fully characterize probability distributions. Uh, in the sense that they give a proper metric on probability distributions, so and that includes kernels like a Gaussian, a Tern family, and many other kernels that we know and love. So moving further, there is also a framework for representing conditional distributions in RKHSs. So if we have two random variables, x and y, and corresponding kernels on x and y, then we can, of course, think about each individual conditional distribution uh, here, p, y given x, uh, for a specific value of x as being represented with an embedding in the RKHS. Uh, but what becomes interesting here is how does do these embeddings vary as a function of this conditioning variable x? And that essentially gives us rise to some kind of vector valued RKHS regression, RKHS valued regression where we are mapping between the two feature spaces. So we map x's into feature spaces, y into feature spaces, and we, we fit some kind of linear model on those representations. So this gives rise to these kinds of conditional mean operators that tell us about how does the conditional mean embedding vary as a function of x of the conditioning variable. Um, so very much like standard regression allows us to estimate expectations given conditioning variable, this RKHS valued regression allows us to estimate expectations of features and expectations of features are the embeddings. Okay, so I'd also like to address very brief, briefly how GPs and RKHS has come together. Uh, there's a lot of overlap in terms of sharing quite a lot of the same, exactly the same mathematical expressions. And a lot of that comes due to this equivalence between the mathematics of orthogonal projections in RKHS 
and the mathematics of conditioning in GPs. So somehow they are essentially the same mathematical framework. Uh, but there are some important conceptual gaps. And one of them is due to the so-called zero one laws, which tell us that on some level, these are different models. Uh, since when we actually sample from a GP with covariance kernel K, the resulting functions, the resulting sample paths will for infinite dimensional kernels almost surely fall outside of the RKHS with kernel K. Um, and there is a sense in which this sample of, uh, uh, this space of sample paths is an outer shell on our RKHS. And that's why often what you see is that worst case quantities in RKHS get translated to average case quantities in GPs. And uh, there's this, uh, perhaps it's not so well known, but there's this uh, characterization of uh, MMD in terms of Gaussian processes that can be thought of just as uh, expectation of the square difference of these, uh, these integrals with respect to P and with respect to Q. Um, so some of these nuances are discussed in our review paper. It's been sort of very long in writing and hopefully it will be updated with the new version at some point soon. Okay, so, and there's one uh, specific thing I li I'd like to address uh, here before I move on to, to the, the specific projects um, is sort of this basic idea of how, how do I bring these concepts together, right? Kernel mean embedding some kind of function we know what Bayesian models for useful Bayesian models, uh, tractable Bayesian models for functions are, they're GPs. So can we build a GP model for the kernel mean embedding? And that's uh, sort of studied in uh, this paper by uh, Seth Fluxman um, and co authors in 2016. Uh, so, um, well, we know that because of zero one lows, the GP with the kernel K will not do because kernel mean embedding lives in the RKHS with kernel K and sample parts don't. Uh, however, there is a way uh, out of this and it turns out that it suffices to use essentially a smoother kernel for uh, the GP model. And one example of such a, a smoother kernel is this, is essentially just convolution of a kernel with itself with respect to some uh, finite measure here. And this, uh, this kind of construction uh, is allowed by so-called nuclear dominance theory that has been uh, uh, developed by Lukic and Bader in a series of papers. Uh, so that sort of gives us a way forward. How do we actually think about these kernel mean embeddings in a Bayesian uh, way? And I guess what's uh, sort of maybe just a kind of a tangential comment here. Uh, in some cases, if you choose specific case, specific news, you might actually get some kernels that are tractable this way. And for example, if you convolve the Gaussian kernel with itself, you will get something that looks like that with respect to a Gaussian measure. Um, so that's I kind of like some of the, the tools that we will need. And now I'd like to sort of get into this uh, specific recent project. Uh, so this first project I will tell you about is, is on uncertainty quantification for causal data fusion. And this is joint work with my amazing students, uh, Siu Lun Chao and uh, Jean-Francois Ton, as well as uh, with collaborators, Javier Gonzalez at Microsoft Research and EY Te from Oxford. So this is a paper that appears uh, in this year's NURBS uh, and it's part of a poster session on Tuesday next week. So you can also find out more details there. Um, okay, so uh, this, paper has to do with causal inference. So let's start by first in considering introducing uh, the notions that we will need. So I'll first introduce a notion of an interventional distribution, which will be important for us. Uh, say that we're interested in the effect that intervening on some treatment variable X here uh, has on certain response variable Y. Okay. Uh, in most cases, uh, we have observational data and hence uh, there might be also some kind of confounder Z which depends on both X and Y. That means we're not really interested in the distribution from which we observe the data. We're not interested in the distribution corresponding to this graph. We're interested in a different joint distribution that comes from this graph. Um, uh, where 
dependency between X and Z has been removed, but we have not affected uh, the conditional distribution of Y given X and Z, okay? So moving between these two graphs is called a, a do operation. And in this new graph, we would be able to isolate the direct effect of X on Y. But obviously we don't see the data from this graph, we see the data from this graph. Um, and so this is what we're interested in. This is called an interventional distribution. We write it as PY given do X equals X. Um, and it is a distribution of Y following an intervention on, on X independently of all else. Uh, however, as we said, this is distribution to the second graph from which we don't have any data. Uh, and we then we need a set of techniques that allow us to manipulate ob observational quantities arising from this graph in order to get interventional quantities uh, corresponding to this graph. And that's called uh, do calculus. Okay. So uh, very briefly, there are a number of different kinds of strategies, different kinds of adjustments that allow us to translate observational quantities into interventional quantities. And they all assume very specific fixed causal graphs, DAX, uh, directed acyclic graphs. Uh, and it's assumed that they are known. So when we have that kind of a situation, then there is a particular set of formula that allow us to do these adjustments. And most famous ones are given here, backdoor and front door adjustment formulas. And you can see most clearly what's happening uh, here in the backdoor adjustment, uh, because uh, we have that this interventional distribution can be obtained by a certain integral. And now we're integrating this conditional of y given x z with respect to the marginal of z, just the marginal of z. Okay. So by doing this over the marginal of z, we've broken this dependence between z and x in this graph. Um, and we're sort of moving into the interventional uh, regime. Because if I had a conditional z given x here, then on the uh, this integral would amount to simple uh, conditional distribution of y given x. And there are similar kinds of adjustments for different uh, causal graphs. Okay. Uh, so we have now ways to represent these international, in, 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 interventional distributions using integrals. Uh, and now the question is, can we also represent them in RKHSs? And the answer is yes. Uh, so there's this nice paper by uh, Arthur uh, Breton and Rahul Singh. Uh, from 2020 that considers how to actually estimate these interventional uh, uh, quantities. It turns out there is a particular uh, operator algebra that allows you to do that. So, uh, and we will use that in this work. Okay, so now we've equipped ourselves with some tools, uh, this, this kind of do calculus, and we know how to do it in RKHS2. So let's now consider the specific problem that we have here. Uh, so this motivated example is uh, 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 an example of prostate cancer data. Here I will be interested in some kind of average treatment effect. So I will try to estimate expectation of a certain target response variable, can cancer volume, when intervening on a particular treatment. In this case, this will be statin, statin dosage or statin drug. Okay. So. Uh, we have two graphical models here. It's because there are two data sets coming from two separate medical studies. And what's important to notice here is that these two variables that we care about, the response and the treatment are actually not in the same graphs. So the only variable that appears in both graphs is this prostate specific antigen indicator, this PSA, which is measured, measured in both studies. Okay, so we somehow need to do causal data fusion here to do causal inference while at the same time uh, uh, using both of these data sets. And importantly, because we're using two data sets also quantifying uncertainty arising from these two data sets because data set might have different quality and different sample size. Uh, so if we are able to do 
uncertainty quantification in this context, then this gives uh, uh, this gives uh, space for various interesting things we can do in terms of decision making based on these kinds of estimates. In particular, we can do things like causal Bayesian optimization, where we we'll try to look at this as a function of statin and try to optimize it. So we are looking at the treatment and trying to find the best treatment, the, the best statin dosage in order to minimize uh, this specific response. Okay. So in summary, there are two key challenges before us. Uh, one is that this data is not matched. Uh, so my treatment and my response are never in the same data set. Uh, and hence we need to perform causal data fusion. Um, secondly, we need to have careful uncertainty quantification in order to ensure that quality and sample size of each of these data sets is reflected in our estimates, in our decision-making. So we propose a, a method for tackling these two challenges and it will be termed base in Bayesian interventional uh, mean process and it will combine ideas from GPs, RKHSs, in particular conditional mean embeddings and uh, two couples. Okay, so let's zoom out a bit just to formalize the setup. Uh, here I have a, a very simple case with two data sets. Uh, so I have a data set here of treatment, confounder, and this will be mediator, mediating variable. Uh, that's the first data set. The other one is just the mediating variable and the response uh, target. Um, for simplicity, uh, this is what we will consider. Uh, and so the goal will be to infer uh, average treatment effects or expectation of this response when intervening on uh, the treatment here. Okay, so we will need to make two assumptions in order to make progress on this problem. Oh, sorry, was there a question? No. Maybe I misheard something. So, uh, so we'll make the following two assumptions. One will be that uh, the treatment will be uh, causally affecting the response only through the medi mediating variable. Okay, so all causal parts, if we were to stitch these two graphs together, you know, write them together in terms of all the, all the dependencies there are between all the variables that are appearing in both graphs, uh, then all causal parts from X to T need to flow through Y. Okay. Uh, so that's a serious assumption. And uh, uh, it, it, but it will be important for us because things would get very messy if we don't make this kind of an assumption. Okay. Uh, the second one will be to do with, uh, with basically what's happening here. So if I look at the expectation of T as a function of Y, I will assume that this belongs to some RKHS. So this is a pretty mild assumption because this RKHS can be a very large space of functions. Can I, can I ask a quick question, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, what is the difference? But, so you, you have this first assumption. What is the difference in this independence between this inter interventional and observational? Um, so you basically write do of x. Does this imply the observational independence between the variables as well or not necessarily? Uh, they, they are different notions. So the, neither will imply the other. Um, so in this case, um, it, it means that all the causal parts, so if I put them together, all the, the directed parts, all the causal parts would, fall, would flow through Y. All right, but this doesn't necessarily mean the same. If you think about it, there's normal distributions, I guess, like you said, all right. It does not, it, it's not the same as T independent of X given Y, no. They, are, they don't imply each other. All right, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, Okay, so now we have these two assumptions and now we're gonna use those two assumptions and just some standard RKHS properties and we'll see sort of what does this boil down to kind of like these, the, the, uh, the quantity that we're estimating, right? So we, uh, that's the average treatment effect as a function of X, that's what we're interested in. Uh, so of course we can condition on Y here. 
um, and just integrate through uh, conditional of y given dx. So we can always do that. And then this assumption that we've made allows us to sort of remove the dependence on x here. Yeah. So now we write that just as a function of y. Uh, that this boils down to that f of y, just expectation of t given y. And that's something that can be estimated from this second data set by regression, right? So that's, that's now something that we have a handle on. On the other hand, I have this uh, probability of y given do x. So it's now the interventional distribution, but not of the response of the mediating variable given x, yeah? And that is something that we can obtain from this graph using backdoor adjustment. If this was a different graph, then we would use a different adjustment. Okay, so we are now making progress. Uh, so now further, because we have assumed that F is in the RTHS, I can write this conditional, interventional conditional expectation as an inner product between F and this interventional mean embedding in the RTHS. So now I'm in business. I, I can estimate F from data set two, and I can estimate this interventional mean embedding from the data set one, okay? Both of them are unknown, of course, both of them need to be estimated. And uh, while the paper, uh, the interventional mean embedding approach by uh, Singh et al, they, um, do, do not really consider unmatched setting, but essentially applying their approach in the unmatched setting would be immediate in a way. Uh, and that would correspond to essentially just having point estimate for both F and this uh, interventional mean embedding, okay? Uh, we're interested in uncertainty quantification and hence we will look into ways uh, that, uh, that to replace these point estimates with Bayesian models, right? And we will do sort of that in stepwise fashion. So we'll consider all possible combinations uh, and look at three different methods. So one will basically put Bayesian model on F, the other one will put Bayesian model on the, the, on the interventional mean embedding, and then there will be one that corresponds to Bayesian model on both, okay? So, and we will, uh, along, the, along the route, we will meet many technical challenges. Okay, so this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is IMP, interventional mean process. That means I will use a standard frequentist estimate for the IME, for the interventional mean embedding, and I will put the GP on F. Okay, so there is slight technical challenge is that in that, well, you know, if I want to work with this kind of expression, uh, then F needs to be in the RKHS. So my GP model has to be in the RKHS. So I have to resort to that uh, nuclear dominance th theory in order to construct uh, uh, useful priors. Okay, so that's, that's relatively minor. Uh, and then when we have that, we have GP on F and we have this fixed uh, estimate IME uh, of IME then we have our quantity of interest, this average treatment effect will be an inner product between GPF and this quantity and bilinearity, this will be a GP itself, okay? So then there is a bit of work in order to actually relate the mean and covariance of F to the induced mean and covariance of G. And that's what we need to do here. That's a fairly straightforward route. However, of course, you know, that's just one part of the, the equation. So that's just uncertainty in this data set two in this regression that's happening in order to find that. Okay, so let's uh, look into the other side of the coin. So now we would like somehow to build a Bayesian model for this interventional mean embedding. Uh, and interventional mean embedding can be related to conditional mean embeddings. So we need some, somehow to uh, work out how to think in a Bayesian way about conditional mean embeddings. And so what's the challenge there? Well, if I have this kind of expression, right? So this thing, the posterior draws from this thing have to be RKHS functions of Y for every X. Okay, so that's a little bit non-trivial. So we need to 
to do some work to do that. It turns out that there is a construction that will work out. So uh, using this nuclear dominance here, so we'll use some kind of product kernel. Uh, think of this as a function of both X and Y, use some kind of product kernel and it works out. So that's good. And then again, well, if this is a GP, so if now mu is a GP of both X and Y, uh, then, uh, and I have a, a point estimate for F, again, by linearity, G will be another GP and I can compute means and covariances again. Okay, so that's not too bad. Okay, so we, we've done both sides of the coin, so let's let's do them both. Uh, now we can place GPs on both F. Do you know, can I ask you a, a question? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm just curious because I've never seen this nuclear dominant thing. Uh, it seems like to have valid uh, definitions for your your G, you need to somehow choose your prior to be somehow coupled with the prior you you kernel you've used in for. So you have to basically you have different regression you want to do, but you need to somehow couple the prior you choose between them in a way. Uh, am I and how is how is uh, this not restrictive or how do you go about in practice or doesn't make sense? My question makes sense. Or? No, yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, the the challenge is that if we want these models to make sense, these Bayesian models to make sense, uh, we need to ensure that this key quantity that we need in inference is satisfied, right? But this only makes sense when both of these quantities live in the, in, in the RKHS. So if I uh, want to ensure that, then the posterior draws from each of these, so this is computed from one data set, this is computed from the other data set, have to indeed be restricted to that RKHS. So it is sufficient to have priors, induced priors um, uh, be supported on the RKHS. And for that, we invoke this nuclear dominance theory, which tells us that if uh, I have covariance kernel R of a particular GP, and that R is somehow related to my kernel K, then uh, draw from GP zero R will with probability one live in RKHS HK. And there's sort of like a, a long complicated theorem with conditions on that. Uh, but what we specifically care about is that there is a simple construction that works. There is a lot of freedom in this construction too. So it's not clear really sort of what is the best prior. So we haven't really gotten as far as understanding that, but we've sort of understood what we need to do in order to ensure that these equations make sense. Does that answer the question? Yeah, in part, yes, thanks. Okay, um, all right. So now we're gonna put GPs on both of these things. Um, well, then we have an inner product of GPs and that's not a GP. So that's uh, uh, another uh, nuisance, uh, but we will, so we will need to resort to, if we want to make G a Gaussian process, for example, if we want to use it in Bayesian optimization, uh, then we would need to resort to some kind of moment matching. But nonetheless, this also can be done, right? We can take means and covariances of this, posterior means and covariances of this, posterior means and covariances of this. We can uh, uh, you know, combine them in a way to get in induced mean and covariance of this process here, which is not generally a Gaussian process. And I guess I should emphasize, so mu y given do x equals x is uh, an RKHS valued Gaussian process, right? So it's a sort of a, a strange thing. So. Um, it's not it's not the same kind of thing as F, for example. Okay. Good. So um, let's look at some results, right? So we, we have these three different methods, and it's sort of like um, it's it, it's uh, it's very nice now to look at kind of ablation studies. So what uncertainty matters here when we have two data sets? And this is a very simple example. So there's just uh, these two. Uh, causal graphs. So there's no uh, confounders here or anything. It's you know, all uh, kept very simple. So I have x to y and y to t. Okay. So IME is just a point estimate. 
So it's an estimate of this average treatment effect. How does intervening on X uh, change T? In this case, it's just conditional quantity and interventional con quantity are the same uh, because there isn't really any confounders. Uh, so IME in this case just gives us a point estimate, fine. Uh, then there is this approach from the paper on causal Bayesian optimization by Victoria Alietti and others that resorts to sampling that does uh, give us some uncertainty estimates, but as we see, those uncertainty estimates uh, do not seem to be well calibrated at all. Okay. And then we have these three proposed approaches. So remember, IMP and Bayes IME, they put a Bayesian model on one of the uh, one of these things, F or the IME. Uh, so here, for example, Bayes IME, this is quantifying uncertainty in the first data set. So the X variable here appears in the first data set and where there is no observations for X, uncertainty goes up as you would expect, okay? So it's a little bit more difficult to uh, tell where should uncertainty go up here if we're just looking at the plot of X. So here uncertainty should go up for those values of X that correspond to Y's that don't appear in the second data set because I and P quantifies uncertainty in the second data set, uh, but sort of fails to quantify uncertainty here at these points, uh, at, at, at these regions where there's little observations of X. Okay. And so as you would expect, Bayes I and P takes uh, best of both worlds, right? So. And it's interesting if you actually look at the implied covariance of this method, it would be a sum of the covariances of these two, and they will also have an interaction term. So there's, uh, this all can be written down in gory details, um, which uh, I refer you to uh, to paper four. Okay, great. So uh, now I can sort of try to specifically look at the calibration of these things. I can put back on my frequentist hat and I sort of look at these posterior credible intervals, I can do some sort of frequentist uh, coverage analysis. So if I think about the posterior credible interval of a Gaussian process, right, so it's 95%, I can, uh, you know, in a simulation study, I can look at how many times do they actually capture the true quantity, which is obviously a frequentist notion. So that would be true coverage probability. Uh, and uh, ideally you would want to have uh, a line Y equals X here. And you see again that uh, sampling as is sort of visible from this kind of plot too, uh, pretty much fails to capture uncertainty uh, in a calibrated fashion. And then uh, you have these two approaches that calibrate one part of, uh, that, that, that capture one part of uncertainty, but not the other, whereas this basin uh, appears to be getting close to uh, nominal coverage. Okay, that's great. And so uh, what we can do next now with that we've convinced ourselves that uncertainties coming out of this method are useful, we can go ahead and run causal Bayesian optimization. And uh, these are uh, three examples. So these are two are uh, just some synthetic examples uh, using various adjustments, back door and front door, uh, where uh, in particular, I'm using a, something uh, uh, for, for mediating variable, I'm using something that's multimodal. Um, that's, if we have something like that, then it's very important to do RKHS representations of these distributions if they are multimodal, because then we can really capture the multimodal structure. Okay. Um, and so you see in this case that you get much faster convergence uh, than the baselines. Uh, and the causal Bayesian optimization methods that use sampling. And this is true also on this healthcare example that I motivated uh, the, the problem with uh, on the prostate cancer data. Okay, great. So uh, just to summarize this, this first uh, project. So uh, this base imp is, is a Bayesian method to estimate these average treatment effects from unmatched observational data. So it uses various tools. It uses RKHS tools to represent uh, 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 distributions, interventional distributions in RKHSs. And then it uses a GP model to quantify uncertainty. 
And this uncertainty can be captured from these multiple data sets and, and can be combined effectively. Uh, and so one of the limitations, major limitations here, when we're talking about uncertainty, sort of we're talking about a very specific kind of uncertainty. It's uncertainty in uh, epistemic uncertainty in functional relationships in these kinds of graphs, right? It's not uncertainty in the graph itself. So in order for these backdoor adjustments, front door adjustments to work, we need to assume that we know the DAG, we know, know the causal graph. And I guess uh, an important practical question would be how to relax this. Okay. Um, so I think that's sort of finishes this part of the uh, talk. Now I would like to tell you uh, in the main time about something that's that has a similar flavor, but uh, a very different kind of motivation and application than me. Okay. So uh, this is a uh, uh, joint work with uh, two of my uh, amazing students again, Siu Lun Chao and Shaheen Boabit. And it's also in NURPS and it's in the same poster session on Tuesday. So uh, the work has to do with statistical downscaling and we'll see sort of how, again, ideas from GPs and RKHS has come nicely together. Okay, so motivation here is remote sensing data. And Shaheen in particular, uh, my student Shaheen is, is specializing in that. So he's a part of the uh, training program we have on the interface uh, between climate science and machine learning. So one of the important challenges when analyzing remote sensing data is that it is difficult to spatiotemporally match observations. So again, we will get into some kind of unmatched setting. Uh, if observations arise from different sources. For example, we could have two different data products that arise from different satellites. Uh, so in these illustrations here, we extract aerosol optical de depth from one satellite and these reflectances from the other satellite. And they will tend also to be of very different resolutions. So in particular, AOD for practical constraints in the measuring equipment is measured at a very low resolution. While these reflectances typically have a, a much higher resolution. On the other hand, uh, one can consider some kind of climate model data of cloud properties that are related to both of these as providing a way to couple these different variables under consideration and to essentially mediate between them. So again, we will sort of be talking about some mediating variables uh, uh, for different unmatched data sets. Okay, so here's uh, a structure of the problem that we're considering. So we'll assume the following kinds of two data sets. So the first one will be certain high resolution covariates that are captured at a very granular level. So in this illustration, so maybe they correspond to some pixels in remote sensing images, and they are very granular. And to each of them, we will associate a certain variable y that will play the role of a mediating variable that will be captured at a lower resolution. But they will be matched, as this figure indicates. Okay, so that will be the first data set. The second data set will be a data set where we have low resolution mediating variables and low resolution response of interest. So this is what we care about. These sets are what we care about, what, but we observe them at a very low resolution. So now what we would like to do, we would like to use these high resolution covariates to downscale these sets, these responses. Okay, so downscale responses Z to the level of granularity of the X's. So that means I want to learn some kind of function of X that sends me into these Z's, but at this high resolution. So let's formalize the problem. How should we think about this? Um, so we need to build some kind of likelihood for how do actually these 
high resolution Zs that exist but are not observed, how do they aggregate into these low resolution Zs? Okay, so that's kind of the key part of our likelihood will be how do we do that? And uh, we will use this kind of likelihood. We will say that in order to get a low resolution Z, we will take an expectation of these high resolution quantities of interest, this f of x's, and compute their conditional expectation conditionally on this mediating variable y. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. So you can think about uh, these x's as being uh, pixels in an image. Uh, you can think about them aggregating according to some administrative units, some geographical regions, administrative units. These administrative units would have certain covariates that correspond to the whole administrative units, like economic indicators or whatnot. That could be your y. And there is a particular variable of interest that you're trying to measure at the level of pixels. Uh, but you don't get to observe it at the level of pixels, obviously. You just get to observe some regional averages. And that's what, that's what these ads correspond to. Okay. So, so that's, that's the likelihood. Uh, and uh, there will be some noise on top. So uh, in a way, this is very similar to something called deconditioning problem that's studied uh, by Kelvin Shu and Fabio Ramos in 2019. They formalize this using RKHS as they say, well, I have some RKHS function G and I don't know that's an expectation, conditional expectation of some other function F. Can I use observations of G to infer F? Yeah. And they have a particular procedure using RKHS op op uh, uh, operators. They call these the conditional mean operators. In a way, they are pseudo inverses of conditional mean op operators. And they have rather complex chain inference derivations that allow you to get from G to F. So our contribution will be basically to propose a Bayesian model that's very simple and that's going to uncover their estimates, basically get essentially the same expressions in a much simpler way. And in addition to that, be able to quantify uncertainty because we're using a, a Gaussian process model. And in a way, it's very simple because if we place a Gaussian process prior on these apps, then that induces very much like what we discussed before by linearity, some kind of Gaussian process distribution on G. And G are what we get noisy observations of, okay? So if in particular uh, F is Gaussian process with some mean and some covariance, then I can relate the mean and covariance of G to the mean covari and covariance of F and to the conditional mean embeddings corresponding to these conditional distributions. So in particular, this covariance of G will boil down to something that depends on these conditional mean embeddings. And uh, so now the idea has become very similar to what we've seen in the previous part of the talk, where we have two quantities, essentially. Uh, we have these conditional mean operators that can be estimated using data set one. Here. And then we have this deconditioning procedure, sort of going back from G to F, that can be done using data set D2. And so that's what we do. So I'm not going to sort of bother you with these expressions, something, but the story is really, really simple. If F is a Gaussian process, then GP is Gaussian process. Not only that, they are jointly Gaussian. Hence, if I observe noisy versions of G, everything's jointly normal and I just use Gaussian conditioning and I get posteriors and I'm done. And this extremely simple uh, framework uh, leads to the posterior mean estimate that's essentially identical to the one that's obtained by Sue and Ramos with rather more complex chain inference procedures. And in addition to that, it has uh, a covariance too. Okay, and just quickly, let's look at some results uh, for this uh, atmospheric uh, temperature example. So here we will observe temperature at low resolution on a world map. So uh, gray here indicates that those uh, points are not observed. 
So we are observing temperature at some points and at low resolution. But in addition to that, we have these various high resolution covariates that come from uh, climate models. Okay, so we can do that at various granularities, we can do that um, everywhere. Okay, and so this will now be used in order to downscale this temperature. And here you see sort of the ground truth. This is also coming from a simulation model, so I know what the ground truth is, and I can uh, I can evaluate uh, from the climate model, and so I can evaluate the actual uh, uh, performance of the methods. And so, and this is what we obtain with our method. And there's also, of course, a confidence region that we can look at. So, uh, compared to just simple kriging, as well as to uh, one of the previous approaches that also comes actually from my group. Uh, it also operates on aggregate likelihoods, but cannot handle unmatched data and hence requires sort of multiple stage procedure. Uh, and you can think essentially of this previous method as being a special case of what I presented now, where there is no Y, there's no mediating variable, there's essentially Y is just one hot encoding of each of these bags. So if, you, if you go back to this example, so Y is just indicator of what bag we're in, just J. And um, there's a little bit, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I think it's instructive to think about this V bag as that. So it's sort of very important to exploit the smoothness in this mediating variable uh, for this particular example. Okay, so uh, just to summarize the second part. Um, so this is a Bayesian solution, it's scalable. Uh, it can be uh, very easily combined with variational inference. In, in, in fact, that's, that's what we do with, with these examples. Um, it handles unmatched multi-resolution data. And again, we see this nice combination, how we can combine Bayesian models on one hand with the RKHS framework that represents these conditional distributions, differential distributions and similar, and to, to get actually uh, very, very sensible, uh, interesting uh, models. So in this particular uh, project, well, some future challenges would be, well, you know, I, I, I'm kind of like saying there's this mediating variable again, and I'm saying it's observed in both data sets, uh, but there's somehow implicit assumption that the distribution of Y is the same across these two data sets. And that of course might not be uh, 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 true in, in practice. And so what if this mediating uh, variable actually undergoes covariate shift? What can we do in that case? So I think I will, uh, conclude with that and just leave you with this uh, with these two references that I've talked about uh, and you know thank you for your attention um, thank you very much uh, Dino for the nice talk um, and the two different parts uh, are there any questions I see uh, one hand was up by Luis, uh, please go ahead. Oh no, sorry, that was that was a clap. <laughs> ah, the clap. Uh, well, thanks for the for the clap. There is another clap. Um, are there uh, any? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. A um, bit more of a broad question, but some of the techniques and tools you developed here seem super useful for COVID modeling especially the do calculus where you can like do some intervention. Uh, this seems like extremely useful to like hypothetically reason about what interventions and what kind of impacts they can have in certain areas uh, or even over countries. And then this up and down scaling as well seems very useful. Have you thought of, or are there any interesting data sets you can apply this on? Have you thought about any applications uh, in the, in, for this pandemic? Uh, so no, that's, that's, that's that's a brilliant point. That's that's a great point. Uh, like in, in my work, that uh, we've looked at some uh, some COVID data in a slightly different context, N not not for these two uh, applications, unfortunately, but in a slightly different uh, context, we did look at how one can use vector adjustment formula combined with kernel independence tests to sort of try to uh, tease out the causal effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, onto 
the, the mortality. So, but as always uh, with these things, uh, there's quite a, a lot of issues with data itself. And uh, we did get some conclusive results based on that, but um, I, I, I'm afraid it's not something that was extremely surprising. You know, it just sort of told us that most of these non-pharmaceutical interventions actually do have a causal effect. Um, so in terms of downscaling, so it's, I, I, I'm not aware of any specific data sets with this kind of setup where, where you know, like um, uh, data sets for COVID modeling with this, with this kind of setup, where this kind of setup could be useful. Uh, but if you have any pointers, I'd be more than happy to, to, uh, to, to look at that. I'd be very grateful. I don't have anything concrete. I know, well, I heard that EY is very involved into COVID modeling. So given that he's also on the paper, maybe maybe he would be an interesting person to talk to. Uh, yeah, thanks. That's super interesting. Um, any any other questions in the room? It's funny that you have. Uh, I mean, funny. You have a uh, collaboration with Javier Gonzalez. I think we have in the room an author of the conditional Bayesian causal Bayesian optimization papers that you that you beat. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm actually I have a clarification question that I sh maybe should have asked earlier. Uh, I think I'm not sure I understand the generative model for the. Uh, second part, so the downscaling, and maybe it's because it's not the notation uh, I'm used to. But uh, would you mind just uh, giving a just one minute again explanation of how um, how the data is connected, what's the latent, and so on? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, there is a latent function that sends us from these x's to the z's. So that's kind of the the, the key. Gaussian process that we're interested in. Um, and so and that happens at this level of granularity, you know, at, uh, yeah. at, at the level at which you'll observe these high resolution covariates. Right? But um, we don't observe X and Z in the same data set. Um, and hence, we are sort of interested in kind of like linking that latent function with this other latent function that tells us about how these low resolution responses depend on the mediating variables. And this is this uh, G. Uh, and so the G will play the uh, play a role of, uh, will play important role in our likelihood definition, right? So, because we observe these low resolution Zs for certain Ys. So that would be kind of the Gaussian process where we actually uh, see direct observations, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so that link between f and g is modulated via this conditional distribution of y of of of, of these z's given y's essentially, um, and that's where we need to to look at the conditional mean embeddings. So because this g of y can be thought of as taking expectation of the high resolution COVID, uh, uh, response, high, sorry, high resolution response, and essentially aggregating it over this low resolution region. So you're taking these values, you're aggregating them to get the low resolution value, but this is done conditionally on the corresponding value of mediating variable. Is this helpful? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I th I really get the intuition of what's going on. I think I would need to to delve into the uh, the details to see which uh, which mapping you're learning the embedding of. And, uh, yeah, but cool, thanks. Um, and I see more why you chose uh, to present both papers together because they have the same flavor of. Uh, Bring, bringing together different regression problems. Exactly. Um, any other questions for Dino? Don't seem to see any. Um, 
Well, if not, uh, let's thanks uh, Dino again.